Today is March 30th, 2015, and my name is Christina Bennett, and I'm here in the Senior Physiologist Lounge here at the Boston Convention Center as a part of the um, annual meeting for the American Physiological Society. Today, I had the pleasure and honor of interviewing Dr. Naranja Andala from the University of Manitoba and to uh, capture his living history um, of his research and career. Dr. Dalla has been a member of the American Physiological Society since 1971, and he's been affiliated with the University of Manitoba Faculty of Medicine since 1968. Dr. Dalla has published over 600 publications um, throughout his career on the topics of cardiovascular pathophysiology and pharmacology. So, uh, Dr. Dalla, welcome to the Living History Project. And are you ready for this interview? Well, thank you, Christina, for uh, giving me this opportunity. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Martin Frank for, uh, for this uh, unique honor to uh, let me say something about myself. I think it's an extraordinary great program that you capture people's uh, reflections in a very nice manner, and I hope uh, my interview today reveals something about myself uh, the way you wish to want me to do. Oh, well, we're excited about this. So let's start from the beginning. You were born in Punjab, India? And, I, yeah. I was born in Punjab, India, and uh, I had uh, uh, four brothers and two sisters. And I was the eldest uh, son in the family, according to the customs. Uh, parents always uh, give much more attention uh, to their first child, uh, particularly if he happened to be a son. And in my case, uh, it was just an extraordinary experience uh, for me to be growing up in a very loving family. Mm. My father was a, a businessman, and my mother was a, used to take care of the household. She had always uh, three to five servants to help her, mm. taking care of not only a large family, but lot of relatives and friends who used to visit us quite frequently. Mm -hmm. My parents were very generous people and uh, very kind, compassionate to other people. They really, my father really took care of the financial needs of the, of the people uh, around him in this village, which was about uh, 8,000 people. Uh, and my mother always took care of the, the children for uh, who were not uh, that fortunate to have everything mm -hmm. in their homes. And so we were, we were very raised in a very special manner. And I, I thought those days will never come back. It's a, I could never match the substance and style of my own father, mm -hmm. uh, whom, who has served as a role model for me. And I tried to simulate him. Um, but I could never reach to his expectation. He was too nice a person. <laughs> well, what stimulated your interest in research and science? As I was growing up, I wanted to be a movie director. Oh, wow. Uh, because there were a lot of social uh, problems at that time in India. India just got an independence, uh, and people had too many problems. So I thought this is a very nice way to make a dent for myself. Uh, I will be doing something very useful. Reason was that I found out during my college days that I was neither a great uh, student nor a uh, extraordinary athlete or uh, uh, dramatist or artist or uh, player or anything. There was <laughs> nothing unique in me. So I thought this movie business will be an extraordinary idea, but it was a uh, readily, I recognized that it was too hard a profession, and one needs uh, appropriate contact, contacts and uh, resources uh, to fulfill that type of ambition. Mm -hmm. So after gr graduating my, from the college from Punjab University, uh, Khalsa College of Punjab University, I, I uh, did volunteer services in one of the laboratories which they were doing some medical experiment by using uh, Warburg uh, experiments. Mm. 
uh, and measuring tissue respiration. Uh, when somebody from New Delhi came and saw me doing this, he was very much impressed that I could uh, uh, do something which he mm -hmm. was looking for somebody to do in his own department. Mm -hmm. So he asked me if I could uh, work in his laboratory uh, in New Delhi. So I moved from Amritsar to New Delhi with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I found out that, that he, he have only had the apparatus but not the accessories to do any experimentation uh, with that, uh, he made me work as a chemist uh, with somebody uh, to find out how herbs uh, can be utilized to, um, you know, medicine plants can be utilized to for isolation of active ingredients for medicinal purposes. And I readily, you know, it was a real challenge. I uh, started perfecting some technology f towards that. And I was very, very lucky to, to isolate some active ingredients, but I had to then study them for their actions on the human tissues. Mm -hmm. And I decided to work on the cardiovascular system uh, at that time and learned some cardiovascular techniques of uh, pharmacology mm -hmm. and started t testing the effects of these uh, drugs both in vivo situations and in vitro uh, isolated hearts. And that was it that I published uh, several papers with that. I was, my work was very much admired by people mm -hmm. and I, I really gotten into this uh, uh, thing and I, I think that was it to 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 turn into me into a my profession where uh, I have I grew up. And did you receive your master's in science using doing these studies, or is this I, before your master's? I received a associateship in institution of chemistry, which was equivalent to master's in chemistry mm -hmm. uh, there. But uh, very interesting that the. I felt that my education was not complete. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, not good enough for the interpretation of results which I will obtain from uh, my work with those drugs. Mm -hmm. So I needed an education and luckily two people came. Two people came to visit our department and they both uh, went abroad uh, to learn uh, uh, pharmacology. Uh, one went uh, to the University of Toronto, other went to University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And both felt, identified me as one of the, one of the reasonable candidate to recommend mm -hmm. uh, for admission to, to the graduate programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I did, I received the acceptance letters from both of the, both of these institutions and, but, the, but the University of Pennsylvania sent me the letter a uh, little few days before then the, you, that uh, I received from the University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And since that was the first, so I accepted uh, to move to University of Pennsylvania and to study my pharmacology degree. Wow. And so tell us about your project, your PhD research. I went to University of Pennsylvania to study P MSc degree and uh, with Dr. Niels Hogard. And he was a extraordinary uh, scientist uh, who was in fact a pioneer in biochemical pharmacology. And I worked with uh, him on uh, the role of phosphorylase activation in uh, cardiac function. And I was also there at University of Pennsylvania I developed a very strong relationship with uh, the chairman of the department, Dr. George B. Coyle, who was very famous for uh, discovering pollinase esterase. Uh, and uh, just his presence always made me feel that I was talking to a very special person. Mm -hmm. And it was very inspiring. And in fact, he, he himself uh, infused a spirit of excellence uh, in me for doing nice work. So I, this was my, my relationship with the University of Pennsylvania. I wanted to come back to, to India, but I think God never wanted me to do that. I, uh, I met uh, 
a very nice gentleman at a federation meeting in Atlantic City, mm -hmm. Dr. Paul McLean from University of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And he was a remarkable individual, a great pharmacology teacher. Uh, in fact, he uh, represented a sort of a, a image of uh, honesty and uh, greatness. So he offered me a, he offered me a teaching fellowship, which uh, uh, I accepted to go to Pittsburgh uh, because this provided me opportunity to teach medical students. Mm. Because he genuinely believed that people who do uh, medical research must teach uh, to students, and they learn uh, what are the problems, and they should find solutions to those problems. Uh, he was a great teacher. He was a great teacher. I learned a lot from, from him. And so I completed my PhD degree with him in cardiovascular medicine, uh, in pharmacology, and uh, I met a, a person, a professor of physiology. He was Norman Briggs. He was working on calcium regulation in the, in the skeletal muscle. And in those days, sarcoplasm reticulum was a, a very buzzword, new word, mm -hmm. and people used to work, wanted to work with it, but he was the only person who was working with that. And I was impressed by, by his uh, commitment, uh, the way he illustrated to me that calcium plays a very critical role in, in cardiac function. And this uh, turned out to be my area of investigation during my, my whole life. But I met another gentleman there uh, who was visiting that place, and he asked me what I want to do. And I told him that I want to, I want to find solutions to the uh, heart diseases. And he looked at me, and uh, uh, we, he was not convinced. He said, no, you will be unable to do it. Hmm. Because by this time, I accepted the job as an instructor in, in the Department of Pharmacology in Pittsburgh, and he thought I need more training. Hmm. And he gave me this advice because uh, he was a godfather of uh, the person I was very, uh, developed a very close relationship at the University of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Dr. George Cooley. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, this man, uh, at that time, uh, did not get a Nobel Prize. He was no less than Julius Axelrod. Mm -hmm. Julius Axelrod was the person who really, really made me feel that I need further training. And he identified two people. But there were several people who wanted me to work f with them. Mm -hmm. uh, from the meetings, I used to go and uh, present my work. And people will come up and ask me if I would like to work with them. But I did not leave Paul McLean at all. I, th I thought I should, uh, I was committed to him to do PAT, and I committed that. Mm -hmm. But then after, I, after this man, Julius Axelrod, told me, he did not get the Nobel Prize at that time. He, uh, he told me that I should work with somebody. And I chose to work with Dr. Robert Olson. I thought he was the person who was nominated for the Nobel Prize, but could never <laughs> get it because there was some sort of a misunderstanding uh, about him. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the, the work he did with the myosin, he thought the defect in myosin was responsible for heart failure. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but somehow it did not work out uh, the way he wanted. And so I moved with him there in St. Louis. Mm. And how many years were you in St. Louis? Well, Dr. Olson was a, one of the very powerful individual, outstanding scientist, uh, very committed to uh, improve the human health. Uh, and he had a huge department. There were 32 faculty members in St. Oh. Louis University at that time, mm -hmm. and 57 students. He himself had five assistant professors working with him. Wow. So readily he found out that I was good enough. He got me appointed at the Department of Pharmacology in St. Louis University, but made me work uh, in one of his laboratories mm -hmm. because he provided me extraordinary facilities in that laboratory. 
uh, on heart research uh, and uh, uh, turned out to be a very good experience for this. So I stayed there as if for two years. Then again, uh, George Coyley came to to St. Louis as a as a invited uh, speaker and found out that I will not be able to fulfill my uh, objective for becoming an independent investigator because Dr. Robert, Robert Olson was a too powerful mm -hmm. and too important individual, so I could never grow under his sh shadow mm -hmm. in such a big way. Mm -hmm. So he, in, right in my office, he called the University of Manitoba. He called the University of Manitoba, asked, there was a, he had a friend in uh, pharmacology, P Professor Mark Nickerson, and he asked him that there is a fellow from uh, Indi India, and he could be very useful to your, his university. Mm -hmm. But he, Nickerson was not there, but some other professor, Innes Mark, uh, the Ian Innes was there, and he, uh, he, he said to him that the, they have a no job in pharmacology, but there is a physiology chairman, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Arnold Neymark, who just got recently appointed. He's looking for people to set up uh, some laboratories in his department. Mm -hmm. So I, this made me meet uh, Dr. Neymark, an extraordinary individual. One does not have a, uh, even luck to meet such a great man every day. Uh, so again, I, I saw him in uh, Atlantic City, and uh, he he offered me a job uh, to set up a experimental cardiology laboratory uh, in such a way that I, it was difficult for me to say no. Uh, so I, but at the same time, it was not easy for him to give me the job because I required tremendous amount of money to set up mm. for my research laboratories, which he organized in his uh, department and, and offered me a great support for, uh, granted me a great support to, to set up the new laboratories in, in his department mm. uh, and uh, provided uh, financial support for people to begin with. Several people from the United States moved with me mm. uh, to Canada. Wow, and uh, so how many people were in your lab at that time? There were seven people we, we were there, yeah. and, uh, and I, I tell you this, uh, Dr. Olson was not in favor of me moving from St. Louis, but I convinced him, I used to call him boss man. So I, I convinced him that uh, I will continue working with him in close association with him, mm -hmm. but he should let me go. And not only let me go, he, he gave me the a truckload of his equipment, uh, which he said it will be not useful to him anymore because I'll not be there. Uh, and I took it to, to Canada and uh, I, there it started my career in, uh, in, in physiology in Manitoba. Wow, it sounds like you've had a, a lot of role models to help you shape your career and get you started. And I think Dr. Neymark uh, was genuinely interested in my research program. Mm -hmm. uh, and he believed in uh, promoting young people. And how did you set uh, up your mentoring style? He made me to, of course, work very hard because mm -hmm. he, his expectations were too high. Uh, <laughs> in fact, the, uh, the first heart research center of excellence the first uh, center of excellence in heart research uh, by Medical Research of Canada was, uh, was set up with me in 78. Mm -hmm. It took me 10 years to develop that. Uh, and that was an opportunity which, which, which really shaped and destined my uh, career uh, in a very different way. Uh, the, but this, uh, my work with Olson in St. Louis uh, really was uh, a prime thing for me to develop uh, that center because he, Olson was given opportunity by NIH mm -hmm. to review 
the review the current status of cardiovascular research in United States. And he gave me this task to, and he sent me to more than 20 universities all over the United States to look at and talk to various people what are the different issues they would like to see. Because NIH, based on his uh, recommendation, uh, set up uh, several uh, centers of excellence in, uh, in, in uh, uh, ischemic heart disease. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I, it, it, but it took me 10 years to promote that concept in Canada. Uh, and I think it was a very nice, it was just beginning of my career. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Neymar uh, very much wanted me to uh, ensure that uh, Canadian science is recognized all over the world. And in, in, I got an extraordinary opportunity to work for some organization I was uh, and, and uh, asked them to to set up a meeting international meeting uh, in Winnipeg and that meeting turned out to be one of the very successful meeting uh, we had at those days we had f about 500 people uh, at that meeting and people were so impressed by my performance uh, that they made me a secretary general of, of <laughs> this organization which was being made mm -hmm. uh, later on I we termed that uh, organization as the International Society for Heart Research. Uh, and this was a, essentially my real niche mm. uh, to, to serve the cardiovascular communities all over the world. Uh, and uh, I think it was th this help was provided by NAMARC mm -hmm. uh, to initial stages, uh, which turned out to be that I, I got the opportunity of serving great people of, of cardiovascular science. And that included Richard Bing, Howard Morgan, Peter Harris, uh, Bob Jennings, and uh, uh, Lionel Lopi, all great men of this, and Wollenberger. Mm -hmm. uh, so for, I served that society for 26 years. Wow. Yeah. 19 years, 17 years as a secretary general, and 19, uh, nine years as a president, or president elect, or past president. <laughs> wow. uh, so it was a, it was a, it was something which I could never dream of. But uh, I was in it, and I stayed in it mm -hmm. for a long, long time. That sounds wonderful, and so do you remember your first uh, experimental biology or meeting? run by APS? Yeah, I, it was the, the meeting there. Uh, there used to be very, very beautiful meetings uh, in Atlantic City. Ah. Uh, mm -hmm. I tell you this, anybody who would, had to attend those uh, knew the joy and uh, excitement these meetings created. Because these meetings were really uh, a source of uh, inspiration to people for exchanging information. Uh, and people really talked about it and this really helped them improve uh, collaborations and cooperations and uh, their own performance and the quality of, the, of their own work. So uh, meetings organized by APS uh, and other societies in Atlantic City mm -hmm. were really great and they continue to be great. What do you think is the biggest difference between those meetings and today? I think things have changing, and it's rightly so. Uh, rightly so, because the science has, uh, the way the science is being conducted today is uh, changing. Mm -hmm. And so I think if the society did not uh, adapt to these changes, uh, it would have been unfair. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a good idea to stay always within the old good days, and the old good is always great days. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think today the, uh, you know, Dr. I commend the leadership of uh, uh, Dr. Martin Frank. Uh, I think under his leadership, the society has uh, uh, continued publishing extraordinary journals. Uh, then they are. Uh, uh, the handbooks they produce on uh, different uh, organ system uh, function, and uh, they are very helpful to people 
uh, they really set the style and set the pace uh, of, of changing and uh, particularly the initiating multidisciplinary program uh, in the field of physiology was uh, I think a major contribution of uh, mm. uh, American Physiology Society. So, the, so Physiology Society has played a central role I will call uh, in uh, changing the destiny of uh, medical research in our in this country or in this continent mm -hmm. and for that matter all over the world. And uh, what advice would you have for trainees starting out today? I think the trainees are uh, very beautiful people. Uh, they are, uh, they have the same attitude as they used to have. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that uh, American Physiology Society is paying much more attention in, uh, in producing young talents because they recognize that they are going to be the futuristic uh, uh, people. They have to be dealt with in such a way uh, that uh, the, if we have to improve the human health, uh, we have to deal with the future investigators, futuristic mm -hmm. investigators. And so physiology is doing very, very good way. I myself, I believed in the same philosophy. I happened to train many, many numerous uh, postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, and, uh, and uh, uh, visiting scientists all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the same philosophy. I gave them the independence, let them develop uh, the way they want and encourage them uh, make their own mistakes and find their own solutions. Um, I thought the job of a professor is to guide and help and infuse new uh, ideas in such a way that people start believing that it is their own thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think I was very fortunate and very successful in recruiting young people who have become leaders uh, of cardiovascular science today. And I'm very proud of them. I always wanted them to be better than me. And they are many times more better than uh, what I ever could be. So I, I think in that way, the training of uh, graduate students is a, and, and fellows uh, is very, very critical. Mm -hmm. if we have to keep up with uh, time because you can't, one person cannot do all the things by himself. Right. One has to have cooperation and collaboration and that attitude has, is, is changing now. Earlier it was a different type of attitude that people used to work in their own laboratory by their own hand and they thought that uh, if they uh, do perfection in their own technology uh, they will achieve great results. But today, uh, things are changed. Mm -hmm. People have uh, established collaborations because I think if you respect uh, uh, the collaborative attitude, then you are very successful because the technology has become so diverse and difficult that one person cannot handle it. And who have been your uh, most worked with collaborators? Have you had a good collaborative relationship that you've developed throughout the throughout your time? You see, my research was based on uh, basically on the on the talents I recruited uh, for uh, as graduate students and fellows and visiting professors. Mm. Uh, because I myself, uh, uh, instead of becoming a movie director, I became a laboratory director. <laughs> uh, I always had. Uh, uh, many people working in my own laboratory mm -hmm. and uh, I was very proud that I was able to maintain for many, many years. Uh, and I never applied from uh, from United States uh, in such a way but the, for any funding. The Canadian sources were always funding. Yeah. I met a person there uh, in uh, Canada in my, in my own department, my new chairman. Uh, who was in 74, who joined there in uh, Dr. Andy Friesen. He was an outstanding scientist. And we exchanged a uh, tremendous amount of uh, new ideas, how 
and on wide variety of issues, not on on uh, science, mm -hmm. but also on society as a whole. And he helped me in achieving the in thriving towards excellence. But uh, and just by by discussions in in such a collaborative way uh, that. Uh, it was difficult to distinguish whether it was his or mine or anybody else a viewpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, I also met another person, uh, Dr. Robert Bimashi, was a cardiologist from Winnipeg. Uh, and I developed a very close relationship with him. I used to call him my spiritual advisor. <laughs> and he helped me developing uh, extraordinary relationship with the business community. Uh, and number of other influential people in the in the city, and that helped me in getting uh, quite substantial amount of money uh, from uh, the public sector, from private sector, and I think I think every scientist should do develop a very good relationship mm -hmm. in their own communities, and and this could help them. Uh, finding more money than what what uh, they need for it, it, so these are collaborative things one can do mm -hmm. so i had a very good uh, idea yeah and what do you see as your uh, biggest accomplishment or what makes you feel the most accomplished in your career it's very difficult to say these things but i was i was one of the first investigators who identified defects in uh, membranes uh, for the first time in the world, uh, and and I employed uh, one of the um, uh, many experimental models on genetic cardiomyopathy, cardi catecholamine cardiomyopathy, diabetic cardiomyopathy, congestive heart failure uh, due to myocardial infarction, mm -hmm. uh, uh, then uh, an infective cardiomyopathy. We all sorts of uh, experimental model I used. And this helped me in establishing the, the linkage between subcellular dysfunction and the, the problem in, in cardiac performance. Mm. And so this formed the basis of the subcellular and molecular basis of cardiac dysfunction in heart disease. Mm. I think this was my uh, fundamental things which uh, I achieved in, during the course of my studies. Mm -hmm. And then, then uh, uh, I was first to identify that how catecholamine oxidation uh, can promote the occurrence of, of uh, cardiac arrhythmias. You see, catecholamines are always uh, increased in under disease condition, and uh, the diseased heart are uh, very susceptible to the arrhythmias. Mm. Question was why? So catecholamine was uh, another way. Uh, oxidation was another way. I I really demonstrated that if catecholamines are activation of sympathetic in the nervous system mm. has to be involved in uh, inducing arrhythmias, then it is through the oxidation of catecholamines. Mm. I also was first to identify uh, the calcium ATPase. Uh, it was the acto ATPase in the cell membrane. Uh, I isolated and purified this and. Uh, implicated its role uh, in the genesis of intracellular calcium overload. Mm -hmm. I think a great deal of work need to be done still in this regard mm -hmm. uh, to find out if uh, this is the true concept. So there were several things I did first in my, my life. Uh, I think uh, people with me were very, very kind mm -hmm. to give me this credit. That's great. Is there anything else you'd like to share about your history that with us today? Well, I think I hope I have taken quite a bit of your time. Oh, that's, that's uh, great to hear. And uh, I think I would like to say that uh, even to give some advice to some people, but it's very difficult to give advice to people because right now I believe that young people are much more uh, intelligent than uh, I was, uh, and so my advice to them may not be of any uh, value. But at the same time, I do believe that hard work, an honest approach, and respect to others, uh, particularly others' viewpoint, is very are the real pillars 
of success. And I think these were the criteria I had always in my mind mm. when I developed my professional career. Well, that sounds very wise and very useful to everybody who's uh, starting out today and going forward in their career. Well, I thank you so much with, for this interview and for helping uh, be a part of the Living History Project at the American Physiological Society. Thank you very much. This I'm very proud. Great. This is great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.